Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. My grandpa and his friends hunted down a werewolf in the 1960s. Attention. This is a family history that no one knows if is true. My grandpa died before I was born and my mother was the one that told it. She says that my grandpa always defended that the story was real. Also, I checked with my mom and she told me the real version as far as she remembers it. So, my grandpa was a normal teenager from the farm. He never did a lot in his teens and was a very average dude. He had a lot of friends tough from mixed ages. The story begins with him coming back from wandering around with his five close friends at the time. They agreed beforehand to go to one of the friends' house and test a new farm tool that the description was very vague. It was something that people used to cut meat at the time. My mom says that she thinks was a Bosch machete in German, but could have been just a normal knife slash axe. They were going there until they saw some angry farmers yelling at each other in the middle of the road. My grandpa and his friends approach asking what happened and one of the farmers says, this idiot killed my chickens. The other one turns to the guy and says, fuck you. I did not. My chickens were killed too. To be very specific, those were metropolitan farmers. They did recently move out from the rural area and brought some chickens and seeds to make their personal farms, it was relatively common at the time, and some still do those personal farms to this day. But since they were relatively new to the metropolitan area, the chickens weren't at the backyard and yes, at a poor fenced front yard. So, one of my grandpa's friends was a 25-ish-year-old adult. This guy had already traveled through the country and was familiarized to this type of situation. He says to them to calm down and then points at one of the few dead chickens that were lying around the front yard of one of the farmers. None of you killed the chickens. He says, they were killed by a dog. The farmers look at the chickens and each of them sees the few carcasses that had left of those chickens have had been bitten off large chunks of meat, and the bites did resemble the ones of a dog. The two realized that they were being idiots and apologized to each other. My grandpa and the rest of his friends were just watching the whole thing. I have experience with this kind of stuff. If you want, I can hunt down the damn dog that did this to your chickens, says the 25-ish year old. The farmers look at each other and then look at him. How much? How about 100? I will have to lay some traps and buy some meat so I can lure the hound. The farmers accept. The guy after talking a little with the farmers comes back to the group that was basically doing nothing. Hey, you guys want to help me? We can use those 100 to buy some beer. Needless to say that the four teens were very excited with the idea. 100 bucks at the time was a relatively big amount of money so a lot of beer was coming. Anyway, they bought some meat, brought the material to make traps, and that knife slash machete slash axe that I mentioned before. What better test than to kill a hound? So, they assemble the traps and discuss plans to make it seem like it was a difficult job, so that the farmers don't back down the deal. They go to their homes and assemble at those guys' houses at about 23.30. They place the meat at the traps. They get into position and wait for about an hour and a half. Everyone was basically sleeping at this point. And then... They see movement at some bushes nearby. Thinking that a normal dog was about to show up, the guys begin to get excited. They can kill the damn hound and go home finally. Guess what? Surprise! It's a two, five meters wolf-like beast that comes out of the bushes and roam around the traps, sniffing the air and grabbing the meat, casually destroying the traps that were too small for his size. Everyone was pretty much paralyzed and shitting their pants. The 25-ish guy was with a oh fuck expression. No one knew what to do. The wolf beast appears to notice one of the teens hiding. 
The thing gets closer and closer to where the guy was. It gets in all fours and makes a position typical of predators, laying low and preparing to jump at the kid. In a panic, one of the teens jumps of its cover screaming and running over to the wolf thing. He is followed by the other two teens and the 25-ish guy. The beast was startled and gets up. My grandpa and his friends attack the wolf thing with their bare fists, virtually making no harm to the creature while the same throws them away with its forearm and pure strength with one blow. The thing turns around to my grandpa that was at this point thrown to the ground like he was a piece of paper. Basically, he weighed nothing to that creature that had just essentially made him and three friends of his fly to different directions. Out of the sudden, the wolf thing starts to scream and howl. It turns around to reveal a knife slash machete slash axe halfway deep into his back, desperately trying to reach it and take it off. In front of the creature was my grandpa's friend that was in cover a minute ago, fearing for his life. Needless to say that the wolf thing was more than pissed. It turns to my grandpa's friend growling, still with the knife slash machete slash axe in its back. My grandpa then runs over to the beast just to take that object off its back, then sink into his back again, making another deep wound and taking it out of its back again. The beast howls and throw my grandpa away another time. The thing gets in all fours and runs off. My grandpa and that 25-ish guy run to get that thing. Now they were pissed. My grandpa was armed with that knife slash machete slash axe and the 25-ish guy was with a trunk or a pointy stick. So, those big wounds in its back made a trail of blood that my grandpa and his 25-ish friend followed all night. When they get to the wolf thing house, they find a guy naked with two large wounds in its back. The guy just stands there, looking into nothing in the middle of the room. The 25-ish guy takes a rope that was close to the door and laces the guy cowboy style. Then they drag the guy outside and tie him to a tree trunk. When outside, they realize that the entire night was spent hunting that guy. They pretty much knew about werewolves but didn't knew what to do now. They didn't have anything that would allegedly kill a werewolf. So my grandpa just goes and asks to one random guy to go get the police. The police arrives. My grandpa and his 25-ish friend told them what happened. The police shrugs and arrest my grandpa, his friend and the allegedly werewolf for fighting. They didn't believe in one word that my grandpa and his friend saw yet. They do some interrogation. My grandpa stays in jail until evening. Then he and his friend get released. Apparently the allegedly werewolf was wanted for the assassination of a guy in Sao Paulo. Anyway, they go back to the rest of the gang and tell what happened. They pretty much promised never to talk about it since nobody would believe them and the treatment for craziness at the time was way harsh. That knife slash machete slash axe became legendary in that circle of friends, but it was lost due to time. No one ever found it or talked too much about it. In accordance to what my mom said, the knife slash machete slash axe fell in a lake or was thrown into a lake. Again, no one really knows for sure. My grandpa had two ribs broken and his elbow was cracked. The other guys pretty much were intact except for the 25-ish guy that fell with his arm into a pointy rock and needed to get patched. The farmers didn't want to pay my grandpa and his friends, but the police gave them a reward of 350 bucks. Naturally, they spend it all in one night. Second story. I am hunting the werewolf that killed my father. It spared me because I held a Bible in my hands. I had everything I needed. Pistol with silver bullets. Silver blade. The only thing that could kill the beast. Sturdy pickup truck that could follow it through the mud if necessary. Adequate food and water that could last me for days. I wanted to kill this thing so badly. I could feel the rage pumping through my veins, corrupting my blood and sending me into a near frenzy. It ripped my father in half right in front of me, remorselessly 
with an apparent blood lust that I'm still trying to process. I lived alone with my father for a few years, taking care of him, helping him do basic things because he had become decrepit in the last several years. We lived in a small shack on the edge of nothing, a bleak and dense wilderness. He often told me stories of the wilderness, of those that went in and never came back out, or if they did, they were forever changed. Many nights I would sit on the back porch, sipping beer and staring out at the thick line of trees. My father and I would go hunting in those woods, but only so far. We could always see the cabin from our stomping grounds. In a weird way, I developed the belief that as long as we were in the shack's sight, that it would protect us. Which of course was shattered when my father got brutally murdered in front of me that night. I probably would have been a goner too, except in my desperation and terror, I picked up the Bible and held it in front of my chest. The werewolf howled, and its fist froze an inch from the book, and promptly pulled back. It then sat on its haunches and whined like a puppy. For a brief second, my gaze turned incredulously to the book, and when I glanced back up again, the beast had gone. I wept for my father, and when the tears were spent, I buried him in the backyard. After my grief somewhat subsided, I collected my thoughts and a new goal formed in my head, that of vengeance. I'd often sit on the back porch and stare at the Bible, thinking about how it saved my life that night. Then I remembered what the priest said happened to his wife many years back. I couldn't believe I didn't think about it before now. I did hesitate, but my dad had been religious, at least vaguely, and had a sort of tenuous friendship with Father George at one point. So I made the trip, about half a mile down the road. The decent-sized house sat right at the end, seeming like a damn thing. I remembered the whispers around town, that the priest veered from his faith, and that was why his wife had died. I took a few deep breaths and got out of the car, walking up the gravel road and knocking on the door. The day was fine enough, a bit overcast and just a little chilly, but okay. I stared out at the priest's acres and felt a sense of peace, my very first slice of it since my father died. Father George opened the door and smiled, and not the fake kind of smile my father and I had been given because we were poor. He just saw us as members of his flock. I wasn't necessarily a religious man, but I admired his consistency if nothing else. I came into the living room, and he asked if I wanted anything to drink. I said just a bottle of water would be fine, if he had any. Once he emerged from the kitchen, he handed me the bottle of water and sat down. After an uncomfortable silence which only lasted a couple of seconds, I spoke up. Father George, I won't lie, as I believe you'd frown on that kind of thing, but I came here for a reason. I know you always liked my father and I, and, well, something has happened to him. Something similar to what happened to your wife. What you said happened. Father George cleared his throat, maintaining his silence for a few more seconds. Then he said, I try not to think about that night. But when I do, my heart is filled with a rage that I just can't let go. I am practically a feeble old man. I want to take vengeance on the beast that killed my wife. But two things are stopping me. I am a holy man. Secondly, as I said, physically I do not think I am up to the task. I told him that I was. The same beast killed my father, and would have done the same to me if I hadn't held the Bible in front of me. Father George paused. That is interesting. Since I was wearing something holy, it didn't occur to me that it could have been the reason I wasn't mauled by the beast. All of this seems to suggest that it is an instrument of holy vengeance, and my own sense of right and wrong pales in comparison. But it killed your wife, the woman you loved. Father George's eyes became moist, and he looked away. I need your help, Father. You are the only other one who knows about the wolf, and honestly, I can't do this alone. I am not the only one, Father George said. 
There is one other. Her husband fell victim to it. Or so she claims. But I do not know if you can trust the woman in the woods. Father George told me that a woman lived in the woods, not far from the main road. He told me he would consider what I said, but that I should leave for now so that he could collect his thoughts. I got up in my car and left. Even though he told me I couldn't trust the woman, nonetheless I was compelled to seek her out. I parked my car near the shack my father and I built with my own hands. Then I went behind the shack and entered the woods. I could have just parked my truck anywhere on the side of the gravel road, but I didn't want anyone in town, especially Father George to see me entering and exploring the woods. He above all us would know what I was up to. I believed Father George was being authentic and telling how things were from his perspective. But being a priest and everything, his view was restricted to what he currently believed. I had to travel my own path. The woman's tent didn't take long to find. Not really. I probably hiked for about a mile all total, combing the woods back and forth until I saw it. My heart skipped a beat as I realized this was the farthest I had ever been into the wilderness. An elderly woman was hanging her clothes on a line, the ends of the line supported by two trees directly opposite each other. The tent looked small, but I spotted a luxurious rug inside, a wooden chair and desk, and smaller items that I thought might have been talismans or something. The old woman saw me. Her eyes grew big, and she made to flee. I held up my hands, backing off a little. I just want to talk about your husband. I said. She halted in her tracks. Who told you about that? I hesitated. The priest who lives in town. The woman spat on the ground. That bastard has been spreading rumors about me for years. Well, I haven't heard them. She hesitated for several moments then offered me to come into her tent and hear the real side of the story, as she put it. The woman introduced herself as Bethany. She said she and her husband had run a small business in town years and years ago, and based on the dates, it happened before I was born. After I said what had happened in the shack on that fateful, horrific day, she told a similar story to mine, and to Father George's, about how the werewolf broke into the place and slaughtered him right there. Bethany said it was the most traumatic experience of her life, and Father George painted her a liar. No one could corroborate her story, of course, but charges weren't brought. It explained why she fled the town and decided to live in the woods. The town had shamed her. I wasn't sure why I never heard the stories, or maybe my dad did and just didn't tell me. I would have thought one of the other people in town would have told me, but maybe she was the town's dirty secret. Or maybe they were afraid of her. If you don't believe me, Bethany said, go to the only abandoned building in town. It used to be a dry cleaning service. I do not go inside the buildings anymore because the werewolf only kills inside buildings. It cannot kill you in front of anything you have built with your own two hands. But inside, it has domain. Father George has no doubt told you he thinks the beast is an instrument of holy vengeance, and I believe that's true. This is a weakness of it, however, and for reasons that are unknown to me. Bethany said she wouldn't talk to me further until I had checked out the old one-story building. I remember passing it hundreds of times during my lifetime, never giving it much thought except how creepy it looked. The door to the building opened easily. Large chunks of wood were missing where the doorknob should have been, clearly. People had broken into it over the years. I opened the door and went inside. Everything was dark, and I turned on my flashlight. Always kept several in the car. Something my dad taught me when I was younger. You do not want to be stranded somewhere, in a strange place, completely in the dark. I shone the bright beam all over the large room, near the desk, scanning the rows of empty racks. I didn't see anything of interest at first. Then someone's ghost materialized in front of me, and I let out a scream, 
almost dropping the flashlight. I was trembling too severely to move or flee. Bethany never should have cursed the beast, it said. I know she did it to avenge my death, but it's only brought pain to her. The ghost's voice was wispy. I could barely hear it, but the whispers sent violent shivers down my spine. The man had clearly been killed in a grisly way, similar to my dad, and I tried to avoid looking at the ghastly wounds. It remained for several seconds, before wavering and disappearing. As soon as the tremble ceased and I knew the ghost had gone, I fled the building. I hurriedly opened the truck door, fumbled putting the key in the ignition, finally turning it. I took the car out of park and peeled the hell out of there. I had unfinished business with the woman in the woods. Based on what the ghost of her husband said, it stood to reason that she was responsible for the wolf creature killing my father. After all, it seemed that her cursing the beast resulted in something horrible happening. The ghost disappeared before I could find out what. On the other hand, the woman cursed the wolf creature to avenge the death of her husband. So it killed before that. Bethany was still putting her clothes on the line when I came to her little clearing. A pang of sympathy momentarily sliced through me. I was still angry at the prospect that she was responsible for the beast killing my father, but I didn't see it as deliberately murderous, more like blind fury. I met your husband a little while ago, I said. His ghost. You didn't tell me I'd meet a fucking ghost. I said. I can still see the terror in your eyes. You are telling me the truth, Bethany said. He told me that you cursed the beast to take revenge? My husband was a kind man, but only told you part of the story. For some reason, I felt as if his ghost gave me the power to curse the beast to channel its killing urge to annihilating those that lack faith. Because my study of the occult has led me to believe that the priest is responsible, albeit indirectly, for the origin of the wolf. It came to be because he had faith, then abandoned it. After the death of my husband, and its transformation by my hand, the werewolf seems to seek the same in its victims. Be but his wife, I started. She died, yet he survived. You said that it seeks out those that are like him. He should have died. You mentioned the werewolf didn't attack you when you held the Bible. If Father George was dressed as a priest in that moment, he would have been spared. I found this strange. Sure, it explained why he had been spared that one time, but not all the other times after he could have killed. It didn't seem possible that he'd be dressed like a priest 24-7 or carrying a Bible. There had to be a better explanation. Honestly, I didn't know what to think. This werewolf seemed equal parts mystery and horror. I realized I couldn't rely on the perceptions of Bethany or the Father George. I needed time to think. I knew that each second that passed would give the werewolf another opportunity to kill me. I figured that as long as I held a Bible in my hands, I'd be safe. So much had happened that I couldn't even think straight. That was as much of a danger, if not a higher one, than giving the beast more time to annihilate me. Driving back to my shack, I noticed how deep the night had settled into everything, pervading every crevice my eyes could see, and all the hidden ones, that people probably wished would just go away. Back at the shack, I sat on the wooden chair and leaned over the desk. I lit the lamp on the desk a few moments before, and a soft glow filled the room. I realized I hadn't gone through the trunk since Dad died, and that I probably should. I opened the trunk, seeing all the possessions he had accumulated over the years. Most of it was loose leaf papers, or small, leather-bound journals. I did my best to go through them all, making sure to keep the Bible close for protection. Once I had read most of the journals and papers, I just sat there, incredulous. My dad had known the wolf, had conversations with it, 
I remembered he told stories of those who went deep into the woods and never came out, but apparently he was one of the lucky souls who did and lived to tell the tale. My mind returned to the question of why the werewolf had spared the woman in the woods and the priest, while killing the priest's wife and the woman's husband. My rage at wanting the thing dead dissolved into an intense curiosity and then spiked into a constant state of low terror. I hadn't been very deep into the woods. My father had built a kind of vague mysticism around it. The thing he had used to instill such a feeling of terror in me was something I knew I needed to chase after despite my fear. The woman believed that the werewolf killed her husband for reasons unknown to her and killed the priest's wife because of its lack of faith after she transformed it, channeled it, as she claimed. But Father George had been wearing holy garb, equivalent to my Bible. So why had he been spared? She had even said the werewolf had been created from Father George's lack of faith. Not just lack of faith, but having abandoned his faith. Of course, the faith might have ebbed and flowed in the man, considering he was still a priest. But did the beast really make such distinctions? Underneath all the papers in the trunk was a secret panel. Inside lay a shining pistol. I checked to make sure it was still filled with silver bullets. It was. My father told me that if I ever needed to go into the woods, that I should take this pistol with me. But be warned, son. Despite what you might have read, you cannot kill the werewolf with a silver bullet. Only seriously wound it for a time. I grabbed the pistol and headed into the woods. The moon seemed suspended in a hammock of clouds, and I swallowed nervously. I know how werewolves are perceived, except my recent experience taught me that werewolves are real, and that they can be vicious killers waiting to pounce from the dark at any moment. As I went deeper into the woods, my fear increased. I could feel my blood pumping in my ears, and my left hand shook around the pistol. I didn't even know what I was looking for, but for some reason, I knew that if I went far enough into the woods, I'd find what I was looking for. Eventually, I came across a cave tucked behind a thick line of trees. I barely glimpsed it as I scanned the trees, but then my eyes went back to the blur of gray between the trees. If the werewolf was hiding anywhere, it would be inside, I told myself. I crept closer to the cave, pointing my flashlight closer to the ground so that I wouldn't arouse attention. I jumped several times while approaching the cave, but the sources of the sounds were only harmless critters. Once I was near the mouth of the cave, I had no choice but to shine my flashlight inside. I didn't see anything at first, so I had to venture further into the cave. The beam bounced all over the cavern walls, and I noticed deep scratch marks that upon closer inspection were tally marks. When the beam finally caught a patch of dark brown fur, which seemed to shudder with each long, beastly breath, I screamed. Two red eyes, sleepy and menacing, peered from the bubble of darkness. You are your father's son. I know you, the werewolf said. Stay back. I said, even though you savagely killed my father, I can't shoot you yet. It wouldn't even do any good because silver bullets can't kill you. I need to know, why did you kill my father? Father George's wife? The husband of the woman in the woods. The woman said that she cursed you to attack those that lack faith. Father George lacked faith, according to, that woman is a fool. She does not control me, although she thinks she does. The magic provided by her dead husband, the perfidious soul who deserves to languish, only increased my rage at those that are unfaithful. The pistol shook in my hands again. I tried to keep the beam steady, but it kept bouncing on the cavern walls. Wait, are you saying you annihilate those that have been unfaithful to their partners? The werewolf nodded and bared its teeth. What about my father? My mom died long ago. Are you saying he was with another woman? Your mother isn't dead. 
She still lives, but a thousand miles away. She thinks he is in the ground rotting, and you with him. He led a double life, and you in its shadow. Then the werewolf got on its legs, bared its teeth again, both red eyes radiating a murderous gleam. All of a sudden, the beast lunged. I fired the pistol. Two bullets landed in its chest, another in its right leg. It whimpered and fell to the ground. I emptied the remaining bullets into the beast, and its spasms seemed to roll together before it went entirely still. I cautiously approached the motionless body. Then what happened next, I'm not quite sure. The werewolf stirred, growled, and its claws barely missed my foot. A billowy cloud of smoke filled the cavern, first a deep and frightening black, then becoming white and ghostly. My feet and arms weren't my own until several minutes later. The white cloud surrounding me dissipated, not slowly, but suddenly. The ghost of Bethany's husband floated before me, looking as ghastly as ever. I remember my first posthumous visit to the werewolf. That horrid beast is filled with revelation, isn't he? I couldn't talk for several minutes. The terror needed time to loosen, and my mother was still alive. When I recovered my wits, he took me deeper into the woods, far enough from the cave that eventually I stopped looking over my shoulder. Bethany's husband led me to a great pine tree, which seemed taller than the others. At its base rested a small ornate box. A bejeweled blade rested inside. The only thing that could kill the beast, according to the ghost. Shortly after, I embarked on the mission to remove the werewolf from this town I lived in most of my life. But I soon found that it wasn't easy to stalk and kill. It always seemed to be one step ahead of me. With the ghost's help, I tracked it to a gas station in the middle of nowhere an abandoned one at that. I finally thought I had cornered the thing. Part of me didn't want to extinguish it for good because it had known about my mother. It knew about my dad's secrets, that he uprooted me from my childhood home that I didn't even remember and placed me in this strange, isolated town where my life had been reduced to hunting a werewolf that, as far as I was concerned, knew the deepest, darkest secrets of the universe. Third story. Kidnapped a werewolf. It's simple. You get a phone call the person on the other end of the line tells you what to do. You do it. No questions asked and you're rewarded. With what? Money, women, gold. Whatever it is you want so long as you do what you're told and when to do it. It's not rocket science. It's nothing the normal person couldn't do. Depending on the task you choose your reward is even more intense than the last. What could be more wonderful? What's the catch you ask? Some of the things you're asked to do isn't exactly legal. It was a normal day in my life, the day I found this magical hotbed of wealth, sex, and drugs. Like every other day I settled myself into work, cooking for a bitch of a boss that didn't seem to give two licks for anyone, but himself as he stalked about the kitchen as if he was a shark hunting for prey. His ragged breathing hot on my neck as my knife diced cleanly through a tomato. The rush of excitement I felt as the soft flesh peeled away to show the red, juicy insides kept the annoyance if the boss off my mind as his eyes popped out of his head. Slice up and down. He snapped at me as if I wasn't doing that anyways. I swallowed the scarcasm that burned into my throat, giving a curt nod to the angry giant who turned on his heels before bounding away in an almost ape-like fashion. I returned to my chopping as I prepped food for the dinner rush that was promised to fall upon the five-star restaurant I currently worked in, heat sweltering in the depths of my outfit as I moved skillfully through the kitchen to grab more of the supplies I needed excitement dancing through my bloodstream as I spotted the meat I would soon butcher for the night. My skills consisted of cutting anything and everything with joy, passion, even courage as I took down live fish or chickens. The farm-to-plate restaurant was a perfect place for me, but something was missing in my life. 
Yeah, I got paid at least 500. I paused. What did you have to do? My eyes trailed from the meat in hand to the other preps, only a few arms lengths away from me. I could feel cold blood dripping down my gloves fingers, dropping onto my boots as they spoke. I just had to drive these people to an old house and leave. They handed me an envelope of cash before I left. I watched as he pulled out a crumpled up piece of snow white paper from the pocket of his jacket, eyes darting to the other prep before falling back to the man with the envelope. The two were cleaning their station as it was almost time for dinner shift to arrive. How'd you do it? One asked, just went on this website. The man pulled out another slip of paper, placing it down gracefully to the cutting board below. It almost seemed to glow like a heavenly entity in the lights above, a shining beacon of hope and joy. The rest of their conversation was drowned out as I dissociated for a few rapid heartbeats. I sat in a trace, staring, for what felt like hour but could have only been a few minutes. Charlie, the world started to turn again, as if everything was paused and someone suddenly hit the play button. Charlie, the angry voice cut me from my thoughts as my head swiveled towards the angry man before me. My boss's body covered the door behind him, his head almost hitting the door frame. W what? I said are you gonna cut that meat or let it soak the floor? Dark brown eyes staring darkly into my blue ones before I snapped my attention to the bloody pool that stained my once new boots. I dash, get it cut and get out of here, he shouted, turning towards one of the prep cooks who had just been chatting. One of yous clean this shit up. I ain't paying you to slack off. You have five minutes till it's time to pack up and scram. Neither of the two men questioned him. I watched as they darted towards the supplies closet together. I waited till their shoes vanished from sight before scrambling to the table they'd been working at. Dropping my bloody meat in their cutting board with a sly grin, I chopped it up rapidly waiting for my boss to leave. With a huff I felt the man's presence diminish before my chopping slowed. I glanced at the envelope that was left on the table before me. Nudging the envelope with a finger. No money. Frowning. I turned to the paper. It was crisp, a soft yellow color. It looked old but felt new. My fingers danced against the top of it to smooth out the crinkled lines. Want cash? Cars? Boats or whores. Just follow the instructions and anything you desire can be yours. The shouting of my boss followed by the noise of scrambling feet caught my attention. Quickly I grabbed the paper, stuffing it into my pocket before pushing the bloody cuts of steak into its appropriate Tupperware. Moving quickly I darted back to my station, brushed down my tabletop, dropping my dirty dishes in the sink, and whipping off the last bits of tomato from my cutting board. With that I made my way to the clock-out table, grinning back at the two men who stared angrily at the blood mess I left on their tables and floor, before heading towards the parking lot. Upon returning to my apartment I settled into the false light of my lamp, pushing the dirt, papers and tissues from my desk. Everything collided to the floor with a sharp clatter, my hands sweating as I drove them into the depths of my jacket. The paper was a bit more crumpled then before as I attempted to flee my place of work before being forced to return my treasure to the hands of those who wouldn't use it in the correct manner. Anything I wanted? For doing something as stupid as being a bootleg taxi service? This would be a piece of cake honestly. I sneezed a few times, glaring at the dog for covering my stuff. I was allergic to fur yet my roommate continued to allow her beast of a dog to trample into my room, chew my stuff, slobber on everything before I returned from work. The soft hiss of rain pounded lightly against the glass window of my room as I glanced over the front of the page yet again. The title image was enticing. I could almost feel myself salivating at the thought of all that could become true. Did I really believe that I could have anything? Of course not. 
Did I really believe that idiot at work got all that money? Of course not. But the idea he might have was too much for me to pass. I glanced around my crummy room, the paint peeling, the ceiling falling apart, a view of the parking lot where crack whores hung out. This place was a dumpster kin in the middle of Garbage Island and I needed out. I dreamed of owning my own restaurant, having a big home, a fancy car, a girlfriend, or boyfriend. I am not picky. To get stared, please download one of the web browsers below. I blinked a few times. I remember these. I used to download these things to go on the deep web as a teenager. Of course as a teenager I got spooked by the smallest things and never dropped farther than a few feet of the murky waters in the shark infested internet. Pulling my small laptop to a sitting position I got started. My memory serves me well as it only took me an hour to download and access exactly where I needed to go. Picking up the paper it had a very specific set of click here to go here, type this here to do this, watch this to be added to this. It was a bit longer and confusing at times, but I pride myself on how smart I was, how skilled with the internet I was. Finally I came to a page. It took a few heartbeats to load. The front looked almost like Craigslist, but instead of the usual, buy sell slash trade, mentality it had different lists. Money, women, specific expenses, special requests, a few more as well. Under these was prices, hours, names of top brands like Apple, Disney, Sony, whatever else you could possibly want. I went to click on the money slot only to have a chat box jump up. Hello, I hesitated. The name was just admin one. Hello? Before we get started, I'm going to need some information. He sent me what looked like a job application. It asked for social, date of birth, what my current and old jobs were, skills, driver's license, as well as some other personal information. Was this a scam? I clicked out of the chat windows, clicking on the lower paying amount which was 100. It took a few seconds to load, and what jumped up looked just like Craigslist yet again. Ads were covering the page. I need a ride to this location. I need someone to drink this, who wants to suck a dick? And more followed. All these things were easy. ID drink someone's piss for 100 why not? Clicking out I explored the other numbers up to a thousand. Some were a little sketchy, from doing nasty pranks, stealing, robbing, raping, and even kidnapping. Yet I found myself not caring in the slightest. None seemed that terrible to me at the time. I know, I'm awful, but I need money. I laughed at some of the stupid ones. Help me kill a vampire, Snapchat Mothman. I want to fuck a demon. Those would be easy money. I didn't believe in that nonsense anyways. I figured I'd take on a few easy ones and be set. I pulled the chat window back up. It took me another hour to fill out their forms. After I filled out one, I was sent another and another. After that I made a nickname for the site before being informed I was going to be reviewed and would be contacted via my cell phone. He had me pick and choose some of the tasks I was interested in and with that I logged off. Giddy like a child on Christmas, I could hardly sleep that night, devoting most of it to sneezing and laying in bed overjoyed at the idea of leaving this shithole soon. Sleep fell upon me late that night. I settled into an uncomfortable yet excitable snooze. A week passes. I was a little broken hearted as I heard nothing. I decided to check the website again to see if an admin would be online but when I tried to reach the site it wouldn't allow me. Depression started to take over. Panic. I gave them all I had. My bank account information. My social. ID. How would I explain this to the cops? Finally, on my day off, I was sent a text. I scrambled from the warmth of my covers, blood roaring in my ears as I looked over the text from an unknown number. Hello Charlie. You have been accepted by the admins. You will receive a phone call within the next hour. Good luck. Good luck? It was like clockwork as the phone rang only seconds later. 
My heart leapt as I put the phone to my ear. A ragged voice purred at the other end, Hello, Scrooge. I grinned at the nickname. I'd like to hire you. I was hired that day to follow someone. I met with a very average-looking man. He handed me a camera, tape recorder, and half of $500. With that I was off. The man tipped his hat at me. He was older, wearing formal with a cane. He looked like someone's grandfather but I didn't question this as I got to work. It was a long day. I was informed to spy on a male. He was short, maybe 5'3", long shaggy hair, shaggy beard, wearing lazy looking pants and a t-shirt. He looked like any other normal guy, but I didn't question this. I followed him, took pictures, voice recordings, the works. He didn't seem to notice me. I felt rush of adrenaline I'd never felt before, and as the time came to a close I felt the desire for more. I got paid that night, returned home, and waited. I had three days off. I could do anything. I sat in my chair, logged on, was overjoyed to find the page was up yet again. I didn't think twice about it as I started to pick out jobs. The next three days went by in a blur. I did job, after job, after job. I'd pick a job. Either they'd approve me or reject me before giving me a different job to do. I stayed in the 500 and below range. I stole some stuff, broke into a few homes, made some rather unsavory phone calls. I had already made my paycheck two times over by the end of the three days. Upon returning to work I felt like I was on top of the world. No man was like me. I had so many skills. I could do anything. I learned so much just by doing petty crime. It was such a thrill I almost couldn't hold back my frustration with work. As I started to clean up for the end of the day my boss stormed up to me, his bulky frame looming over me his eyes wide with anger. He opened his jaw to speak, but before his words could tumble out I spoke out. I'm putting in my two weeks, I sneered. The anger on his face melted, brows narrowed in confusion as I puffed out my chest to speak. I found a better job that pays me what I deserve. I informed the male before me. So slash Ricky slash I continued. I'm heading home. I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe, I tossed down my dish towel, stuck my nose in the air before stomping out. What a rush. I hadn't felt that big since I punched Randy Gorman in high school. I entered my home as if I was the king of the world. My smile wide. My chin up. Maybe I wouldn't go into work tomorrow. What would they do? Fire me? I didn't need them anyways. With the way I was making money... I would be living the big time soon. I decided work was shit. I didn't need to work for those assholes anymore. Ricky would live without my help. He gave the chef promotion to someone else anyways. I went full time doing my Craigslist jobs. I still stayed in the lighter range of things. But the more I did the more I felt the tug to do more. Harder things. Evil things. One night I decided to do it. I took on a thousand dollar prize, something I'd been hesitant about. I had to kidnap a baby. What for you ask? Who cares? They could have used this small child as a paperweight and I wouldn't care one way or another. I did what I always did, met a lady in a coffee shop. She tried to tell me some stupid bullshit about it being her rightful baby or something. Who cares really? Boring details. She handed me half of what I was supposed to get. She got up and left. I sipped my coffee, glancing in the bag she handed me. A Walmart bag with a single envelope nestled in the bottom. My smile faded when a noise caught my attention. Someone grabbed the chair across from me, yanking it out causing the metal frame to make a loud, angry scream. Slowly I raised my head. My heart stopped. Standing before me was a large, muscle-bound man with a wicked smile formed over his usually frowning face. Ricky. His hair had recently been cut down. His normally dark eyes seemed to have a new light to them as he took a seat. 
I swore I heard the chair heave in agony under the weight of his large, muscle-built frame. So, Scrooge, my heart stopped. You're the one who's been piling on the work loud recently, huh? My mouth was dry. Nothing seemed to want to come out as I opened my jaw to speak yet silence continued to fill the air. What was I supposed to say? How did he know? Why, yes, I squeaked out. Did I really fuck myself over this bad? Was he sent to kill me? I shook silently as I took a quick swig of my warm drink, looking around to prevent myself from looking him in the eye. That's when my eyes fell upon a familiar face, the man I stalked. He was sitting in a chair not too far away. His eyes in a book narrowed. I have a personal job for you. My eyes snapped back to the man before me. His grin was thin, wide. He almost reminded me like a snake. I almost expected a thin tongue to come out and lick the air around me. A job? I replied dumbly. Of course. I was the best after all. What did that mean? Yes, a job. You'll be getting 20,000 big ones. The world stopped. Did I hear him right? My eyes grew to the size of moons. My jaw almost hit the floor. He looked around us as if making sure no one was within earshot. I glanced around as well, paranoid now, only to notice the man from before was gone. Blinking a few times where he sat, I returned my sharp gaze back to Ricky. W, what's the job? I manage her to spit out, taking another drink of my latte. I see the way you use that knife of yours, Charlie, he whispered, getting close enough to my face that his lips nearly touched my nose. I felt shivers racing through my body as dread ran up and down my spine like someone ran ice claws across my back. Would I be key? I couldn't say it. Was someone's life worth all that money? Yes and no. We just need you to make a very specific cut. He replied smoothly. Sitting back the mail pulled a folder from his bag, pushing the manila paper towards me. As if my hands were made of lead I slowly reached for it. Ricky moved like lightning. He grabbed my hand yanking me towards him so my face was only inches from his. If you accept this offer and mess up in any way, he whispered, your face is going to be in my next folder. I yanked my hand away in terror, glancing down at the yellow folder sitting in the table before me. Eyes wide with curiosity. I was the best, right? I could cut someone for that much money. Yet, the way Ricky was talking... I didn't hesitate anymore as I grabbed the folder quickly, opening it with excitement popping through my veins. The first thing I saw was a picture of the man I stalked. It was the same picture I took. His amber eyes narrowed, his long hair running down his back, something about the way his eyes looked. It was almost as if he was looking at the cam. Well, hang on, who do you think I am? I want a cooking college, not Oxford. I need time to read. Skipping over the picture, I read what was written. For user, Scrooge name, Gunner. Gunner is to be kidnapped, taken to the location on the map. He is to have his tattoo on his calf cut off, not full leg, just tattoo. With knife provided is asked by the payer. You are then to leave, give the tattoo to the payer and go home. If this is accepted, you will be asked to take a week off. I glanced up at Ricky who was sitting back in his chair, eyebrow raised. Are you the payer? No, I'm an admin. I had a few questions, but before any of them left my mouth, he pulled the paper from my hands, holding it up as if to taunt me with it. If you do this, you will be working with me and two others. You will be given all the money at the end. This is a big job. This man will not come out alive, but you will not be part of the main killing. He pulled a picture from his pocket, holding it up for me to see. I narrowed my eyes at the picture. The picture was of Gunner's tattoo. It was the skull of an animal. An animal with what seemed to be antlers. Probably a male deer. Judging from the name, I assumed him to be a type of hunter. 
So he was gonna die. But I wasn't the one who was doing it. I remembered the joy I felt for cutting open meat, the beautiful red. I glanced down at my shoes that still had red stained on them before looking back up at Ricky. I'll do it. The man smiled, handed me the papers. We're going to pick you up tomorrow at 5 a.m. With that, he turned and left. The night went as planned. I broke into the home, super easy, and took the small baby right from its bed. I took the screaming infant to its mother? Who cares? It wasn't as hard as I assumed it to bed as I drove home to get ready for tomorrow. As I got into my room I noticed a package on the bed. I slowly lifted it up and noticed it had Scrooge the duck doodled over the front, causing me to give a dry laugh. The inside of the box had a few more scraps of paper, giving the exact place I would go after the crime is done, what to do after, how to wash off blood and how to take care of the skin. The box also held a piece of Tupperware from the very place I had just quit from not long ago, as well as a knife that was generally made for thin perfect cuts. It was real. This was happening. I was going to help murder someone. I know I was excited before, but this was far greater than anything else I could possibly explain. It was as if my body was filled with lightning. Sleeping was impossible. I stayed up for hours looking over the picture of Gunner's tattoo, carving it out in whatever I could find to practice. My heart was beating so fast I swore the entire apartment complex could hear it as I continued with my work. The time ticked by slowly. I finally slept. Heavy, happy sleep. I dreamed of stabbing Gunner, his blood rushing out, covering the floor, lapping hungrily at the legs of my pants, spewing out, the room filling with crimson. I could almost taste the blood. It was so sweet. My alarm went off. It was 4 a.m. I got to my feet, got dressed in throwaway clothes, got a bag together and waited. A large car pulled up, an all-white van had its windows tinted as well as a license plate for out of state. I was growing more giddy with every second as I scrambled for the door, throwing open the passenger seat and settling it. This was it. I was about to help kill a man. I was going to help kill a man? For a heartbeat I froze. Was it worth it? Maybe this guy had kids or something. Wait. No I hate kids. Who cares? I'll kill his kids too. Are you ready? Ricky asked, glancing down at me. The grunts of a few men behind me spooked me. I looked back to see two men almost the same size as Ricky. I felt no fear surrounded by these large men. After all, Gunner was small. How much damage could he possibly do? I nodded, sitting back in my seat as the car started forward. We drove for about 15 minutes before pulling up to a small park. It was well lit. The full moon glowed above casting cold light against the grasses below. A small playground settled in the center of a sea of grass. Beside this was a path with lights hanging down around it to keep it bright. Every morning he comes running, every night too, I chimmed. Reading the man's information on a slip of paper I found in my folder. I remember taking his night run pictures. More like dusk than night. I was excited. You could hear it in my voice, see it in my eyes. The men all got out of the car, leaving me to my studies. In a sick manner, I wanted to know everything about this guy I could. Sadly, much wasn't on here. Job, unknown. Family, unknown. Friends, none. So on and so forth. It was as if this guy wasn't even real. There were pictures I took of him chatting with a few people. He gave away soup at a kitchen. Was seen paying for someone's groceries. Talking to other people. Snorting at the good two-shoes bullshit, I turned a page to see a small section. Girlfriend. Sawyer, black dark hair, blue eyes. I just had a small picture of them together next to the writing. She was pretty. Maybe that's who won him killed. The bastard probably cheated. I scoffed. Time went by. The moon was slowly starting to die behind the trees. 
The stars danced. Where were they? It had been a good twenty minutes. The sun would be up soon and so would other people. I glanced around looking for any homes but the park was rather secluded. It was then that I felt something smack against the car. Scrambling to the window I looked outside. Ricky was making his way to the door. I moved myself back into my seat as the driver's side swing opened. The large man settled back in his spot, tossing a gun into my lap. Glove box, he snarled. Only seconds ticked by when the back door was opened. One man climbed in. The gunner was shoved next to him before the last man sat down. I sneezed a few times, causing Ricky to grunt in irritation. Saw the gun. Tail went right between his legs. Fucking coward. Ricky laughed. I glanced back at Gunner. His face was covered. Hands tied. Feet tied. He didn't move as we started the car. It jumped to life and stared to cruise forward. I raced my fingers through my shaggy blonde hair as we started our journey. The minutes ticked by. The sun cast dapple light against the clouds, but it was swallowed whole by the threat of a storm. Rain ticked against the window an hour and a half later till finally we pulled into a forest. The trees were dense, large, a two-hour drive, and finally we were getting close. The entire drive I had completely forgotten my hate for Ricky, laughing, joking, and even smoking with the three. You can have whatever drugs you'd like after you make your cut. Ricky mused, my treat. Excitement was bubbling up in my chest as a small home showed before me. It seemed like something you'd see out of a horror movie. One should be worried a bad gust of wind might just knock it down. Holes littered the roof, and in the driveway was a small Chevy Cavalier. That's your getaway car. One of the men informed me from the back as they opened he doors, roughly tugging Gunner out of the car. He let out a grunt, falling to his knees before being hoisted up. I stepped out as well, sneezing a few times as I did so. I glanced at Gunner as they dragged him towards the front door of the house. I had almost forgot he was in the car. He had been completely silent, not a word, didn't try to move or escape. Something about the man made me shiver. He acted as if this was just something be expected. The house loomed over us, its old windows angry, it smelled of dust and mold letting out a loud groan as the door was pushed open and Gunner pushed inside. The inside was covered in dust, the floors were carpet, covered in dust. The insides were empty, gutted out years ago by whomever owned this home. Now all that was left was an old couch dead in the middle of the place, as well as a small little table with a few knickknacks set on too. Gunner was pushed into the couch, and when his body hit the pillows of the cushions, dust exploded everywhere. I sneezed a few times as the dust covers the room. Allergies? One of the men laughed, opening the door to a basement. Only to fur. Not dust, I mused. Must be a cat around here. We need to set up and get ready. You stay here and watch him, Ricky stated as the three made their way down the set of stairs each step screaming under the weight of the men. They're so big the wood's probably gonna break. Am I right? I nudged Gunner's arm with my fist. Don't look so glum. I sat across from him, sniffling as another sneeze took over. You get to go to heaven. I'm sure you're religious. I saw you giving stupid people money. Gunner's eyes glanced up at me, Anger was fuming in their depths as if they were made of fire. You mean the homeless people? He growled, Yeah, whatever. Those fuckers. You know they sit in front of my apartment and eat up all the space. He didn't reply to me. The anger in his eyes just seemed to grow. I felt awkward as I tried to think of something to say. What was I supposed to say to someone I was about to help kill? Nice weather recently. I fumbled. It'll be real nice tomorrow. Too bad you won't be seeing it. No answer. Sue Blue Eyes. She your girlfriend? I opened my folder, pulling out a picture of the girl. 
She's hot. Maybe I'll make her mine after this. I heard the venom in my own voice. If not, I might not give her a chance. It felt wonderful to talk like this, to have so much power. He couldn't say a thing to stop me either, but his reaction wasn't what I expected. He laughed. His laugh seemed to echo against the broken walls of the home. She's scarier than me, he whispered. I bit my lip. What did that mean? I got up, deciding to explore to pass the time. I checked my phone. No signal. I checked around the empty room, but all I found were the car keys for my getaway vehicle. I pocketed them. Turning back to Gunner, who was staring out the window, the rain lightly padding onto the ground below. A few drops of water fell from the broken ceiling. Before I could say anything, Ricky walked up the steps. We are ready. With that, the men came back. They started to herd Gunner down the steps, shoving him harshly with each step. He let out a small hiss of pain as I bound down after the group with a jump in my step. As my feet hit the floor, dust kicked up around us. I watched one if the men ruffle Gunner's long hair as he was forced down into a chair in the dead center of the room. I sneezed a few times as my eyes adjusted to the darkness that collected around us. The only light was from a dim bulb on the ceiling. The sound of shuffling could be heard before a sharp, bright light flickered on. I glanced down to the floor as the brightness burned into the depths of my eyes. My boots were covered in dust. The blood still settled on the top of my boot from what felt like ages ago. That's when I froze. I could see shoe prints in the dust from all of us. I followed the prints from the stairs to Gunner's chair. One of the prints wasn't human. It looked like the prints of an animal. I immediately noticed one of the male's shoes had fallen off in his scuffle a few hours back. But why would there be a... Hello, everyone. Snapping my neck towards the voice, I looked on in shock. In front of Gunner was a large spotlight that shone light directly on him. A few monitors and a video camera. Ricky was wearing a pig mask, laughing as he introduced himself to the world. This was it. It was one of those live stream murders. I heard of these things happening in the deep web, but I never thought I'd be a part of one. I forgot about the paw print as excitement rang through me like a bell. Ricky tugged a small table from the darkness. On the table were tools of all sort. I could see messages popping up on the screen. Put an ice pick in his knee. One typed, drill through his rib cage. Another wrote, scalp him. One roared. Now now we will get to all that, Ricky laughed. First we have a special guest. I felt a nudge. I turned towards one of the men who was holding a duck mask out to me. I felt my heart flutter. I gladly took the plastic mask. I placed it over my face before digging through my bag. I pulled out Gunner's file and the knife, letting out a gasp of surprise as the file slipped. A few pictures fell out of the chocolate-haired male going about his life. My heart tugged. For a second I frozen dissociating as I tried to figure out if I really wanted this. But the money. I looked to Ricky whose hand was out to present me. I felt another nudge as I gripped the knife and made towards the camera. Scrooge everyone. Ricky laughed. He's going to be cutting off a very special tattoo before we get stared. Ricky made towards Gunner who was looking dead in the camera. The same fire in his eyes as before. The large man took a pair of scissors off the table, cutting open the other's jeans to show off the large tattoo on his calf. The world started to go quiet in my ear as I made towards the other's leg. Completely focused, I didn't even hear anything Ricky was saying or doing. It was as if the world was underwater. I slowly placed the tip of the knife against the skin. I shook everything in slow motion. I looked up at Gunner who glanced down at me. His eyes flashed. Was it fear? No. It was something I could identify. You'll regret this, he whispered. I can smell you from miles away. Next time, don't spill any blood. I stared at him. What did that mean? 
What felt like hours was only a few heartbeats before I heard Ricky shout my username. I plunged the knife down. The sick noise that followed sent a shiver up my body. The groan of agony from the man in the chair caused me to break whatever spell was held on me. I slowly started to move the knife around the tattoo. The skin let out soft pops as the knife moved against its soft surface. Crimson dripped from the large cut in his leg to the ground below, splashing into my boots in the same manner as the meat from work. A giddy laugh broke from my lips, sharp metal gliding through the flesh like butter. The blood was covering his leg, my hands. I couldn't believe it as I closed the circle around his tattoo. He let out a few deep groans. As I started to cut the layer off I froze, under the bloody skin was something else. I pulled the knife back, running the tip over the dark hair. I sneezed. Why'd you stop? A voice asked. I looked back up at Ricky dumbfounded before starting my cutting again, but this time no noise came from Gunner as the large flap of skin fell to the ground. I glanced at the opening in the skin only to scream. I jumped back in confusion and horror. Ricky scrambled back to prevent me from bowling into him. I told you, Gunner growled. He had been glancing down at me while I worked and now he looked up slowly to me and the other men. His once amber eyes were now a bright yellow. His face was starting to twist. His teeth clattered to the floor as the skin on his body budged and moved as if they were a ripple in a calm lake. His long hair started to move, swaying, covering his back. The skin split opened, blood racing down his body as the skin crackled to show off the fur under him. Panic exploded through my body, fear burning through my head, blood roaring in my ears as a small voice screamed at me to run. What are you? I hear someone yell. He's still tied down. Ricky shouted, kill him. All three men rushed Gunner who let out an inhuman, earth-shattering howl. Everyone froze in fear. It took a few seconds for me to regain my control as I got to my feet. The men seemed to return to reality as they grabbed knives, scissors, anything to kill Gunner. Fuck this, I hissed, glancing at the screen of words. Everyone seemed to stop typing at once as the large men struggled to shove anything into the hard flesh of the wolf. He's getting loose. Ricky shouted, Charlie help us. I looked from the mess of bodies cuffing Gunner to the door before looking down at the large chunk of tattooed skin. My jaw fell, Charlie. Ricky shouted again. With that the cords holding the werewolf let out a sick snap. I raced forward and snagged up the skin, blood still dripping from it, but the tattoo was clean. A deer skull. In the middle was three large slashes. Just as I grabbed the large chunk of flesh gunner, sunk his teeth into one of the men's necks. I watched in horror as the thorn-sharp teeth broke through the skin so easily. It was as if the man's neck was made of nothing but jello. Gunner tore a large chunk of flesh from its host. Blood exploded from the open wound, splashing against the walls. I didn't waste any more time. I grabbed my backpack and started for the stairs. The sickening crunch of bones could be heard as my feet met the first step. Charlie! The anger in Ricky's voice was nothing compared to the fear that pumped through my veins like blood. I ran halfway to the top of the steps when a loud scream cut pierced my heart. My feet stumbled for a few steps but I refused to look back until my hand collided with the cold metal of the doorknob. Sucking in air, I slowly turned to look at the mess below. Blood stained the floor, covered the walls. One of the men's heads had been crushed into the floor. His brain was smashed into the tarps that covered the area. The other's head was stuck in the wall as if Gunner had tossed it into the now broken computer monitors. Finally, I glanced to the first step where Ricky was trying to pull himself towards me. Charlie, please, he begged, holding out his hand. Gunner, who had been breaking the rest of the computer equipment, 
slowly started to walk towards Ricky whose leg were bent in odd ways, being dragged behind him. Please, he begged. Gunner dug his claws into the man's legs, yanking him down from the few steps he climbed. Charlie, he shouted, tears racing down his cheeks. I shot him a smile, waved, and opened the door. Should have promoted me. The look on Ricky's face is forever burned in my skull. The look of betrayal. I slammed the door behind me. Now I had to run. Now way that damn werewolf was going to catch me. I tucked the scrap of skin into my bag, ripped off the mask, and pelted through the house at top speed. Not only was my old boss dead, but I was about to make a lot of money. I couldn't believe my luck as I tore open the front door of the home, slamming it behind me with force. The car keys jingled in my pocket as I fished for them. It only took a few heartbeats for me to find them. A howl ripped the piece of the outside apart. Rain slowly started to fall again as I scrambled to shove the key into the car door, pulling it open with rapidly. Dumbass. I laughed. I was on top of the world again as the car roared to life causing my body to slowly start to relax. It only took a few minutes for me to put the house miles behind me as I drove as fast as I physically could down the streets. No way that wolf was going to find me. I was safe. I just had to drop off the skin and I was safe. I glanced in the back mirror and in the darkness of the dying day, I could just make out a large shape. It was charging towards my car at an alarming speed. Fear flickered back into my bloodstream. I cursed under my breath as the rain slowly fell. I knew the forest was thick, long, dense. Half of me wanted to pull over and start running but I knew that he'd track me down easily. I felt hot tears burning into the sides of my eyes. I didn't want to die. I was just about to make the money for my own restaurant. Another howl. A deep, angry howl. I knew I was toast done for, pushing daisies. I was dead. I'll never do this again. I just want my own restaurant. I was desperate. I shouted into the air, eyes wide, palms shaking, sweat racing down my brow. I didn't want to die. I promise I'll never hurt anyone again. That's when it stopped. Not the car. Not my tears. But the feeling of dread. It was as if the weight was lifted from my body. I looked in the mirror. Nothing. The rain was the only sound I could hear and soon. I was out of the trees. I'm home free. I drove home. I changed, showered, put the skin in its proper place and left. Now, here I am. I'm sitting in a coffee shop, waiting for the mystery person to give me my money. I have the skin in a bag. I don't know exactly what happened tonight, or even if he was a werewolf, I just know it happened. You don't have to believe me, I don't care either way, because I'm about to be the proud owner of a new restaurant. The only thing I'm a little worried about while I wait? I can't stop sneezing. It's giving me some bad anxiety, but I'm hoping it's just my clothes, they're covered in dog hair. I've been waiting an hour or so. Only people in here and a barista and a lady. It's not her. The lady who's picking up the skin is said to have blonde hair, blue eyes. This lady has black hair, blue eyes. I'm gonna go talk to her and see what she has to say. Maybe she just dyed her hair. She has a bag with her. She actually looks familiar. Oh well. Wish me luck everyone. I'll keep you updated if anything else happens.